dollar store bibs. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like kids. I want to have some one day. And one of the most probably excruciating and fun things is watching home videos. <laughs> have you ever watched home videos and looked at yourself and was like, what on earth <laughs> was I wearing? <laughs> Me and my brother, we like to sit down and watch the home videos and we make fun of each other because we did some questionable, weird stuff. And it's weird because when we were younger, we talked about having kids and where we're going to live. And now I'm getting ready to be an uncle, like a real uncle, not like a fake uncle, you know, the one that like, it's Uncle Charlotte. No, I, I'm not your uncle for real, but I'm going to actually have a little nephew. And it's kind of weird because, you know, it's Josh. And I'm like, <laughs> you're not a dad, you're Josh. <laughs> What's what's kind of interesting is, is the more I watch those home videos and I watch my my activities, whatever I was doing on the on the TV, I'm so happy that I could say at that moment, hey, I'm not like that anymore. I don't talk like that. My voice isn't that high anymore. <laughs> um, I don't I don't drink out of one of these. Um, I don't, I don't play with little action figures by myself in the playroom. Pew, pew, I don't, I don't do that anymore. Um, I close, I don't wear bright green neon MC Hammer pants. <laughs> Dancing across. <laughs> I don't do that anymore. And I, I love to say, hey, I am not like that anymore. I have matured in many ways. I'm not like that anymore. And we look at kids, and we like kids. We, we know that you know kids act a certain way because they're kids. Little Nia, you ever see Nia during worship? She'd be getting it. She's standing up here, and she worships. She's going. Now, of course, she's a kid, so she'll try to unplug my keyboard. <laughs> or she'll go up to the worship leader and say, hey. Or she comes up to pastor while he's preaching. Pastor, up. Pastor, up. And it's very cute, and it's, it's wonderful. But we understand that she's a child, and that if, let's just say Miss Connie. <laughs> that'd be weird if during worship she's going, ah, ah, trying to unplug my keyboard and going up to the pastor during his sermon and going, up. <laughs> that ever happened? <laughs> if that ever happens, call the police. <laughs> so we understand. We, it's, it's, we all understand that there's, there's infancy, there's your baby, and then you go from spiritual, or you go from a, being a baby to being an adult. We all see that naturally, and we understand, and we even agree. You should grow. If you're not growing, then there's something wrong. We see that naturally, and we understand that naturally, and we all agree with that naturally. If we see a 45-year-old man, I'm not 45, but if I was holding the bottle and I was 45 and I was drinking, Mm. You would say, something's wrong with him. <laughs> By this point, because you go from a bottle, well, you go from the breast, then you go to the bottle, and then you go to a sippy cup, and then you go to a regular cup, and then if you're, you know, you can go to the bottle, there is progression. You grow. So if you understand that naturally, then how come we don't understand that spiritually? That we come into our faith born into the faith as spiritual infants, but at some point, you should become an adult. But for whatever reason, I don't know what it is about how we are in the church, we don't think that we should mature. We like to stay little kids, sucking on bottles, saying up while the pastor's preaching, playing with little toys, want to go to children's church. But at a certain point, naturally you grow up, and you start to say there are certain things that are that are inappropriate for somebody of a certain age to be doing, then why don't we hold the same standard to those spiritually? Why do we allow people to remain babies forever? Now, the passage we're going to look at today, the writer addresses this very, very um, pointedly, and 
he's doing this whole conversation. He's talking to Jews who are trying to figure out how do we take our Jewishness and merge it with what it means to be a Christian? Because we don't know how to do that. How do we take what it means to be a Jew and to have all those regulations and things, but now that I'm a Christian, I don't know how to really filter that. It's kind of like if you go from using a PC to a Mac. Now, you know how to use a PC, but if you switch and go to a Mac, you're kind of like, it's the same kind of stuff, but I don't really understand how it works. So the Jewish, Jewish people who are getting saved were kind of like, okay, how do I understand what I read in the Old Testament in light of who Jesus is? And so the writer of this book tries to explain this to them, and he's going through, and in the middle of his conversation, he stops and goes into this discussion about maturity. And in fact, he goes in on them hard. So we're going to look at, look at that this morning, and we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5, book of Hebrews chapter 5, and verse 11. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. Hebrews 5, verse 11. If you have it, say, let's grow. Let's grow. All right. Verse 11. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away, to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and practice inherit what has been promised. Amen. So the title today is On to Maturity. On to Maturity. And if in the message I say Paul, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but I tend to believe that Paul wrote it, and I have different reasons for believing that. So in the sermon, if I say, and Paul said, just disregard that because it's not necessarily true that Paul wrote the book but we don't know who wrote the book um, but I'm just letting you know just in case I say Paul said he said that's not right but just letting you know so he starts off again he's in this discussion about previously he's talking about Melchizedek which was this kind of mysterious figure in the Old Testament and he's going into all these deep things about the faith and then all of a sudden in the middle of this conversation he's like you know what I want to get deeper into these things but I can't you know why because you're slow to learn now, what he's not telling them is that they have a learning disability. Okay? Now, some people have learning disabilities, and they, when they read something or when they try to remember something, they have a difficult time. But he's not telling them you have a learning disability. He's telling me, them you are slow to learn. And 
the, their issue is that they are lazy. The word slow there in the Greek means lazy, it means sluggish, or it means slothful. You are lazy. That's why you are slow to learn, because you're lazy. When you hear, you don't hear with understanding. In fact, other translations will say dull of hearing which is a better translation. You are dull of hearing, you are lazy, you are slow to learn. I want to go deeper, I want to touch on some bigger things, but you just are dull of hearing. If I go into this stuff, it won't stick. See, because learning involves not just hearing, but learning also involves understanding. And if you're listening in a way that doesn't bring understanding, then it's worthless. Sometimes we listen in the same way that we hear freeway noise. You hear it, but you don't really hear it. Or when you're in the store and somebody's talking over the PA system. The blue light specialist, don't you say anything? And after a while, you hear, all you hear is, don't you say anything? You hear it, but you don't hear it. Or when kids are playing in the room, you hear them, be quiet, you hear it, but you're not really hearing it. And it's the same way some people listen to sermons. Looking at me, and all you hear is, because you're dull of hearing. And he's saying, hey, I, I want to get deeper, but I can't. You know how frustrating that is? For a teacher who says, man, I have so much I want to share, but I'm just afraid it won't stick. And in fact, he says the reason why he's frustrated is because he says, by this time, you should be teachers. Now, I like how he says by this time because it, it tells us that growth takes time. Growth takes time. So don't, some people think that as soon as you get saved, you have to know everything. You have to do everything, be everything. But people need time to grow. I don't expect the same from a five-year believer that I expect from a one-year believer or someone who just got saved last week. I've seen people come to church, and get saved that Sunday, and then somebody comes and says, you must stop um, watching TV, you must come to church every Sunday, you cannot miss, and the person's like, okay, uh, and leave, and some of them never came back. You got to give people some time to grow. But his issue with them is that you've had enough time. In fact, by this time, he says, you should be teachers. You ought to be teachers. See, because when there's time, if you're working and you've been giving time, there should be results. It should produce something. If I ask you to come and clean my yard, and it's all dirty and junky, and I say, okay, I'm going to go to the store and come back and do some stuff, and, and you say, okay, and then I come back eight hours later, and it looks the same. I say, what have you been doing? Oh, you know, I did a few things here, and do, but you've been here for eight hours. Now, it would be different now if it was something a little bit bigger. If somebody came in here and said, village, here's $7 million. Build your church. We would all go crazy. Ha, ah, praise the Lord, yay. But if next week you guys come in and say, hey, where's the church? Whoa. We got the money last week. Why are we still in here? That would be crazy. Because you understand it takes time. And so he says, by this time you ought to be teachers. So what he's saying is you've been in the faith long enough, long enough so where at this point you should be teaching. You cannot say, well, I don't know as much as somebody else. You've been in there long enough, you should know. He says teachers. Now, some people freak out when they see teachers. I was having dinner with Ma last night, and I was saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to be talking about this about being a teacher. And she's like, oh, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a teacher, and I, I won't be teaching anything. I won't be leading anything. I just want to sit in the front and do nothing. You do all the teaching. I said, but listen, this is what this, this I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow. You know, you should, you should be a teacher. I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be a teacher. I'm not going to be a teacher. You better not ask me to do anything. Whoa. Are you threatening me? She, I'm not going to be a teacher. I said, okay, wait, wait. Are you thinking that a teacher is just somebody who stands up and do what, what I do or who leads a small? You think that's what a teacher is? Yes. No. You know what a teacher is? Just somebody who can explain. My dad said it last week, I think it was. Are you saved? If you say yes, then you should be able to explain it. That's being a teacher. So by this time, you should be able to explain certain things. You do not need the pastor to give you a heads up to explain sin. He says in church, hey, I need you to stand up and explain sin. Oh, pastor, 
Caught me off guard. I'm not ready. Sin. What do you repent of every day? Sin. You should know what sin is. And yet, you should be teachers. Some of us have been in church long enough, and there are certain things we don't know. And we think it's difficult. Pastor, he's so difficult. He's so hard. He demands so much from us. If you really watch what my dad says, a lot of times it's the very basics. And he says to these people, you are slow of hearing, and by this time you should be teachers. Turn to Mark chapter 8, verse 14. Mark 8, 14, because I want you to see that Jesus also expects us to at some point get it. At some point he expects us to get it. Mark chapter 8, verse 14. The disciples have forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf. They had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, it's because we have no bread. (laughs) Aware of the discussion, Jesus asked, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? And this is just one instance in the Gospels where Jesus gets frustrated with them saying, you've been with me for so long, I've poured into you, I've taught you, and you still don't get it. And for some people, teachers have been pouring into you for years. Pastors have been pouring into you for years, and you still don't get it. The writer of Hebrews says, by this point, you should get it. By this point, you should have some things. Should you have everything? No. But there are some things you should have. You say, well, we're supposed to be like a child, right? We're supposed to come to God as a child. There's a difference between being childlike and being childish. Having, having a trusting faith is being tr- childlike, but just kind of, you know, being childish is not the way God has called us to act, to live. And he says, you should know some of the elementary things. You look at what he says in verse 12. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. The elementary truths or the elementary principles or the elementary elements of the faith. You need somebody to go over those things again. What he's saying is you need somebody to teach you the ABCs and the one, two, threes of the faith. You are 40 in the faith and you're still A, B, C, D. He says this, this is ridiculous. By this point you should know some things. By this point you should have some things down. Punctuation is important. It's what you learn when you're, when you're in school, that you need to put a period because you're stopping a certain thought. You ever gotten emails from somebody, it's two pages of one sentence. <laughs> I'm, ta- I'm looking at it like, man, where is the breath? Where are they going to stop? There's certain things you should know. There's certain, when somebody's spelling, there's certain things you should know how to spell. But he says you need somebody to go back and teach you these elementary truths all over again and over and over and over. And you should know better by now. He's not talking to people who are young in the faith. He's not talking to babies in the faith. He's saying those of you guys who have been Christians, so-called Christians for this long, you should know some things by this point. You should know some things. And he says you need milk, not solid food. This is not a compliment. He's saying, basically, you're a 45-year-old man who needs a bottle. And this should not be because you have been in the faith long enough. And again, the issue is not that they need milk, and that's bad. Milk is not bad. Milk is essential. We need milk. When we come into the world, we need milk. What he's saying is, by this point in your life, you should not need milk. You should need solid food. Now, milk is not bad. A couple of places where... He says this very clearly in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2, 1 and 2. It'll be on the screen. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and of all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. By what? 
it, the milk. So it's not bad, but it's for babies. It's not for mature people. If Mikhail sets a, a, a table before her kids and Oren, and she brings Caleb a steak, and she brings Kendall a fish, and then she brings Oren this big bottle. <laughs> says, here, he goes, thank you, baby. <laughs> he would say, Some, call the police. Something is wrong. He is an adult. Why is he still on milk as food? But again, it's for those who are babies in Christ, not for those who have matured. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. This is Paul. And this is one of the reasons why I tend to believe Paul might have wrote this. It sounds kind of like what he, this guy is saying here. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. So again, milk is not bad. Milk is essential. We need milk to grow. And babies in Christ, they need milk. And even those of us who are mature in the faith, we do need milk at times. But he says at some point, you need to be on solid food. Now, there's differences between the mature and those who are infants in Christ. So look what he says in verse 13. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? Righteousness is the understanding of what God's principles are and then patterning your life after them. So you know what God demands of you, what God requires of you, and you then pattern your life after that. Those who are young in the faith are not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. That phrase there where it says not acquainted, that phrase means inexperienced. They are inexperienced in the living out of the Christian faith. So what he's saying is babies in Christ have not really gotten the chance to practice the very things that we teach. And so this is one of the things I want to say to those of us who have been mature. There are people who are going to come into our church and, and they're going to accept Christ and they're going to be babies in the faith. We need to be patient with them. They are going to mess up. They are going to make mistakes. I can't tell you how many people have come and said, so I messed up, I screwed up again. And in my heart, I want to say, because th the way I am, I am just, you know, you need to be like this, you need to be like this, you need to do it, you need to do it. And the Lord said, no, they're young. They don't know any better. And some people just expect people, as soon as they get saved, to change everything about their life and to be just the best Christian. You got saved last week. Yeah, and now I'm on the worship team. No way. I got saved last week. Now I'm ready to preach. No, that's not the way it works. There, there's a process of learning. There's a process of gaining information and growing and learning how to practice your faith. And so one of the distinguishing marks about an infant and a mature person is their ability to distinguish between right and wrong. And look at what he says. He says in verse 14, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So the mature are able to know the difference between good and evil because they have trained themselves. And so the difference between a baby and those who are mature is that the babies are inexperienced. But the mature are experienced. And how are the mature experienced? Because they have trained themselves. Maturity is something that God produces, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But maturity is something that has to be trained into you. That word trained is the Greek word gunazo, and it's where we get our English word gymnasium or gym. And so he's saying you got to go to the gym. The mature have gone to the gym. They've gone to the spiritual gym. A lot of, t well, you ever go to the gym and you see somebody in there who you just can tell they've never been there? Because they're, they're, they're grabbing weights and they're doing weird stuff with it. That's, that's kind of like, you know, the babies. They come into the faith and they're grabbing stuff and they're doing weird stuff. You're like, oh, that's not how you use it. Come on, let's, let's, let's work through this. And then after a while, you see people in the gym who know exactly what they're doing. The mature are people who have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. And we are mature because we have trained ourselves over time. Over time, we have learned to train ourselves to distinguish good from evil. We do not know something just because we're smart. You've trained yourself. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, Paul says this to young Timothy, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. So well, I thought godliness was just something that you just become. 
You just go to church a few times and you listen to a few sermons. No, that's people's problem now. That they don't train. They take, if I tell you, this is how you get muscles. You go to the gym and you lift the barbell 10 times for three sets and then you put it down and you get on a treadmill and you run. You say, I know that, I know that, I get that, I understand that. But you never do it, will you ever get in shape? Yes, so many people come to church and say, amen, pastor, preach that. Let me write it in my notes. Do you have notes? Okay, cool. And then they never put it into practice. And they wonder why they're still a baby. They wonder why you don't have any spiritual muscles, because you never put it into practice. Putting it into practice is going to the gym, training. And that's what the mature have done. I don't know if you see the difference between a baby and a mature person, and just in things like the senses. When a baby is born, he can see, or she can see, but they don't really know things like depth. They don't really know things like distance. They don't know things like danger. But over time, what happens? They start to pick those things up. So same thing in the faith. There's some people, when they come into faith, their eyes, they can't really tell, okay, is that good, is that bad? But over time, they start to learn. Or the ears. You ever heard somebody who's tone deaf? When they sing, it's just like, do you not know? But that is not how that's supposed to sound. <laughs> and now, to this day, I can, I can hear parts. I can sing parts. I can teach parts. It's kind of annoying to me sometimes because I can hear even the slightest thing being off. And I go, oh, that doesn't sound good. I don't, I don't like that. And, I've, and, and I'm good at it now. But it wasn't always that way. I have home videos of my mom sitting next to me. She's on the piano. And I'm standing next to her, and she's teaching me how to sing parts. So she would say, OK, I'm going to sing this part, and you sing the part above me. See, in those days, I had a high, high voice, so I can go to the soprano part and sing it. She said, how great is the love. Now you sing above that. OK, OK. So she would sing, how great is the love. And I go, how great is the love. No, no, you got to sing above that. OK, sing above that. OK, gotcha, 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 gotcha. How great is, how great is the love. No, no, no. Shalom. Listen, you can't sing the same thing I'm singing. You got to sing above that. Got you. How great is the love. <laughs> and we got it on video. And I'm just like looking. I was like, Lord, what in the world. So it wasn't always like that. But how did I get good at it? Practice. Training. You're not going to be a good singer. You don't train. You're not going to be a good Christian. You don't train. You're not going to be mature if you don't train. You're going to stay a baby. If you don't train yourselves, if you're writing notes, write this down. Maturity is intentional and not accidental. Maturity is intentional and not accidental. You don't wake up one day and accidentally be mature. You worked at it. Maturity is intentional and not accidental. So the eyes, you begin to to see things, the ears, you begin to say, that note is off. That, that, that does not harmonize with the melody of the gospel. That, that's not right. You just start to pick up things. I like this quote by John Piper. He says, the pathway to maturity and to solid biblical food is not first becoming an intelligent person, but becoming an obedient person. What you do with alcohol and sex and money and leisure and food and computer have more to do with your capacity for solid food than where you go to school or what books you read. And we're going to talk about how maturity has to do not just with what you know, but also how you live. It involves both. And this thing is not about age. People think that age, that if you're older, that you are mature. So people, some people say, I've been in the church for 50 years, and people think, oh, well, they're mature. Not necessarily. In fact, some people who are young in age are more mature than people who are older in age. In fact, one guy said, I thought it was funny, he said, there are some few believers who seem to be born with beards. <laughs> Come out the room just ready. And some people just mature faster. Some people are just there. So don't think that age means mature. Because some of you just got saved this year. And so there's certain things you're not going to know, even though you're older. I've been reading the Bible since I was in the womb. So I've, I've just been in this. I've been listening. I've been hearing. I've been teaching. I've been studying. So 
I'm going to be more mature because I've been training. But just because you're older doesn't mean you're going to be automatically mature. Just because you're younger doesn't mean you're not mature at all. It's not about our age. And one of the biggest insults you can tell to a kid is that you're being a baby when they're older. Say, so stop being a baby. I'm not a baby. And again, we know that kids know at some point I need to not drink out of this. Kids now, are you trying to give them this? They go, no, no, no. Give me this. I can get more out of it, and I don't get beat up at school. Walking around with a, with a bottle. So, should I say this? <laughs> now, again, everybody wants to be grown. Everybody wants to be grown, but people spiritually say, I want, I want to be seen as grown, but I don't want to act grown. Don't treat me like a baby. I've been in the church for a long time. It's just like giving a baby a little bit of food and saying, hey, there you go. And they say, I can have more than that. I'm older now. Well, sometimes they can't handle it, and you know they can't handle it. They're not ready for it. It's normal for Christians to grow, and it's abnormal, abnormal for them not to. If somebody is not growing, something is wrong. And again, we notice this. We know this is the way it's supposed to be. We know this. Take, for example, Lion King. Wonderful movie. Simba, as a little cub, what does he say? I just can't wait to be king. <laughs> now we're awake. <laughs> and, you know, he has this whole deal with Scar. Scar's, Scar's a punk and kills his dad and sends him on exile and but when he comes back Simba's not a little cub anymore Simba has grown Simba has matured but what if Simba didn't grow and mature he just comes back still as a cub I'm ready Sky Rawr. we would say this is a dumb story he should have grown by now he needs to be big because he can't challenge Scar unless he grows we understand these things. We know these things are true, and yet we don't want to apply them. Or we say, well, I don't want to be mean to them and, tell, and force them to grow. I'm having the, the youth uh, memorize um, passages of Scripture for youth group, and I'm forcing them to do it. And before I didn't do that, I just say, you know, if they do it, it's fine. If they don't now, I'm like, no, you're going to do it. I'm going to tell your mom. <laughs> don't tell on me. I will. Because I want to push you. At some point, I need to be the spiritual parent here. I need to push you. Otherwise, you're going to just remain here. I tell even the leaders. You tell them I got on them. Say, hey, you guys are going to be in trouble if you do not know this, this passage. And they said, okay, Shalom. Emmanuel Jr. <laughs> Getting on me. Now, some of you might be saying, or even if you're listening on the Internet, you might be saying, well, a baby in Christ is still in Christ. So, I'm okay. A baby in Christ is still in Christ. So, God, he, God knows my heart. He knows that I'm just a little bit slower than the other children. And I'm just going to go at my own pace. I'm just going to, you know, find my little place and just go at my own little speed here. I'm still in Christ. Some might have that mentality. I'm still in Christ, even though I'm a baby. And don't try and force me to grow. Don't try and force me to mature. I don't have to do any of that. It doesn't take all that. So that's a nice Bible passage, but I, I'm, I'm fine just being in Christ. As a baby, babies go to heaven. The immature go to heaven. If I get saved and then I die, I still go to heaven as a baby. So if I'm in Christ and I'm a baby, I still go to heaven. Even, isn't that what it's all about? Isn't it all about just making it through the pearly gates, seeing Peter? I don't know why people think Peter's always at the front gate. I don't know why. <laughs> Is that what it's all about? Some of you are saying, well, man, that's kind of right. But I know it's wrong. The writer here, I think he wants to warn us against something. Let me introduce it by telling you a story. There was a, 
patch of ice that was going down the river and at the end of the river was Niagara Falls and there was a fox on top of this patch of ice and a vulture was flying overhead and sees it and he goes down and he starts to eat and he keeps eating and he can see in the distance that the falls are coming but he thought to himself well I can fly away I have wings I can easily get away from this I'm fine so he just continues to eat as he gets closer and closer to the falls he can hear the water now he can hear it going over he's like but hey I got wings it's easy for me to just fly and get out of here easily it's simple so he continues to eat. And then finally he finishes. And by the time he finishes, he's in the part of the water where it's getting rough. And I can hear it. He can definitely see it now. He's like, okay, it's time to fly away. He flaps his wings once. Doesn't go anywhere. Flaps his wings again. Doesn't go anywhere. His talons had frozen into the ice. He fell off to his destruction. You know how many people think... You know, I'll just accept Christ when I feel like it. I'll grow up and be mature when I feel like it. It's easy. I'm saved. I can just mature myself at any time. And some people are going to wait and it's going to be too late. You're going to want to fly away. And God's not going to permit it. This passage is not just about babies and those who are mature. It's also about those who are pretending, who think that they're in the faith but aren't because they have experienced some of the things of the faith. And it is not true. Look at verse, I'll read it again. Verse 4, actually verse 3. In God permitting, we will do so. Now this is a very scary verse. I don't know if you, if you really catch what he's saying here. He says, you should go on to maturity, you should want solid food, and if God permits, it will happen. In other words, God might not. Do you think you can just grow old and then just on your own just choose to, to accept Christ? I'll turn to him in old age. I'll turn to him on my deathbed. I'll turn to, you, you have no control over that. In fact, you, might not, you don't know when you're going to die, and you don't have the power to do it. In fact, the faith given by God is what allows us to get saved. It doesn't come from, with it, from within us. It comes from God. Now, this passage, um, verse 4 all the way to verse um, Eight is one of the most hotly debated passages where people try and use it to show that you can lose your salvation. And I, and I thought about going into it, but it would take too much time. My dad's probably going to deal with it because a question was asked about losing your salvation last week. And so he'll probably um, appeal to this passage. But look at in verse 4. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because to their loss they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Now many people will look at that passage and they will say, that is teaching that those who get saved and they you know, have the Holy Spirit in them and they hear the word, if they fall away that they can't be saved, that they've lost their salvation. But I don't think that's what the passage is saying. And I don't have time to really go into it. But one of the reasons I believe that is because of the little picture that he gives in verse 7. Look at the verse 7. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop, useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So he has two fields. And both receive the rain from heaven. So they both receive the gospel. They both are in the presence of the Holy Spirit. They have tasted. They have done things. They, they get it. They get the nourishment. They get the water. They get the gospel. But what happens? One field produces and the other field doesn't. And so he says there are some people who have been enlightened. And these terms, people say, well, that can be applied to a saved person. But it can also be applied to a religious person. And again, we don't have time to go through all the passages that would show that. But again, you can be in church and be hearing the gospel. You can be in church and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit and get goosebumps 
and come to the front and get prayer and cry and do all of that and yet be lost because there's no producing of anything. You're not growing. You're not maturing. You're just staying the same. But if you're getting fed by something, you should mature. And so God says here, through this, through this man, that some people think, I'm in Christ, but they're really not. And so if you don't have a desire to mature and to grow, you really need to ask the question, do I really know him? Now, I was looking for something else. There's a book called The Pilgrim's Progress by um, John Bunyan. And it's an allegory. It's a story that he, um, he tells about this boy named Christian that's on his way to the celestial city. And it's basically the story that tells you about Christian truths. It's, a, it's one of the best books. And so I was looking for an audio book so I can um, put it on my iPod and listen to it because I wanted to listen to it again. And there was one part, I just clicked on this site, and it was called The Man in the Iron Cage. So it was just showing you how it sounded. So I clicked on it. And as I'm listening to what's being said, I'm like, why does this sound like so familiar? And as he's talking, I realize that this part of the story I just had randomly, well, not really randomly, but clicked on and was talking about this very thing. That this man, I want to share with you some of that. Now, again, he's on his way to the celestial city, and he meets this man in an iron cage. And this man who's in an iron cage, he asks him, how did you get in here? What's going on? I want you to listen to what he says because it connects to what we're talking about here. He says, I am now a man of despair and am shut up in it as in this iron cage. I cannot get out. I laid the reins upon the neck of my lust. I sinned against the light of the word and the goodness of God. I have grieved the spirit and he is gone. I tempted the devil and he has come to me. I have provoked God to anger and he has left me. I have so hardened my heart that I cannot repent. I have crucified him to myself afresh. I have despised his person. I have despised his righteousness. I have counted his blood a, an unholy thing. I have done despite to the spirit of grace. Therefore, I have shut myself out of all the promises, and there now remains to me nothing but threatenings, dreadful threatenings, faithful threatenings of certain judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour me as an adversary. He's in this iron cage. He can't get out. He says, I, I, was, I was in the presence of God. I heard the word, and I just thought nothing. I just ignored it. And so Christian asked him later, he said, well, why don't you just repent? Why don't you just ask God to forgive you? Why don't you just, just come to him? He's, he's there. This is what he said. God has denied me repentance. His word gives me no encouragement to believe. Himself has shut me up in this iron cage, nor can all the men in the world let me out. O eternity, O eternity, how shall I grapple with the misery that I must meet in eternity? He thought, at any moment, I'll just repent. At any moment, I'll just turn. At any moment, I'll just give my life to the Lord because I grew up in church and God knows my heart. And he said, no. He says it's impossible for those, there are some who are just so stuck in their ways who just believe I can do whatever I want for as long as I want and then I can just turn to God at any moment. He says here, no. If God permits. You know how scary that is? That God might not. So he tells them, I need you guys to go on to maturity and Chapter 6, verse 1, so let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance that, from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instructions about baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So he said, okay, all this stuff is elementary. So he said, so you should repent, you should have faith in God, you know, washings, those are kind of Jewish ceremonial things, and then you have baptism. He talks about the judgment, and he talks about, what else he talking about in here? He talks about um, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and we can go through all those things, but he's saying those things are elementary. Those things are the beginning of your faith. By this point, you should be past those things. Let's move on to maturity. Let's move on to bigger and better things. So what he wants them to do is he wants them to take the milk of the word, and he wants them to live it out, and he wants them to stand on it. 
And those are just the foundational principles. You take what you learned in Sunday school as a kid and you build on it. I, we should not have to keep learning about Noah built the ark. Noah built the ark. Okay, who led the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses. Who sacrificed his son on a mountain? Almost did. Abraham. Who got in the belly of a whale or fish? Jonah. Like, you know that stuff. It's elementary. I shouldn't have to every week, pastor shouldn't have to every week, I said, I need to talk about tithing. I need to talk about faith. I need to talk about repentance. I said, we should be moving on from that. Are those things bad in and of themselves? No. Those things are good. Those things are great. In fact, those things are essential. And those topics are woven throughout the fabric of everything we see in the Bible. So you can't have some things in the Bible without faith. You can't have something in the Bible without repentance. So again, I said earlier that we mature in two areas in what we know in our life. Now, I want to say two things that we learn from this passage, especially in verse 3, and God permitting, we will do so. Number one, God is responsible for the maturing process. God is responsible for the maturing process. You see where he says in there, and God permitting, we will do so. In other words, God is the one who's going to allow you and cause you to mature. If he doesn't do it, then you won't. Some people think that they came to God and started talking to God because God didn't have any game. He couldn't come to you and say anything to you because he's just standing in the corner. He was just like, there you go, God. I want to talk to him. He don't want to talk to me, so I'm just go over and holler at him. God hollered at you. You didn't holler at him. He came to you. You didn't come to him. You weren't standing over there like, hey. He's like, hey. So what are you doing here? Oh, nothing. Oh, it looks like you have salvation. In your hand, can I can I have some of that? Well, sure. I mean, if you want it, I'll just you know I'll give it to you. No, in fact, you were over in the corner dancing, doing or whatever, and he came over to you and said, "Hey, let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm going to save you. I'm going to pull you out. I'm going to I'm going I'm to change the way you think, because at first you didn't want me, and now I'm going to do something to your heart where you're going to be like, man, this stuff, this place is disgusting, nasty. It's dark. I can't see nothing." But strobe lights and people twirling stuff, this is dumb. Let me get out of here. And God gave you a love for his word. He gave you a love for the people of God. But he did that. Nobody walks in off the street. Some people have walked in to this place that have gotten saved, not because of themselves. You ask them, how'd you get here? Well, you know, I was just sitting there and just someone told me to come to church. Myself told me, come to church. No. God called you. God wooed you. God saved you. And he is responsible for the maturing process. If God doesn't mature you, you won't grow. Even if you want to. He's the one that does it. Now, this is going to sound like it contradicts what I just said. Because even though God's responsible for the maturing process, God expects you to work towards your maturity. Wait a minute. Either God is responsible or he's not. It's both. You can't do that. <laughs> yes, I can. Because God did it. Let me show you. Crystal clear. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Philippians 2, 12. Look what he says. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation. Who? Who, who works out the salvation? You. With fear and trembling. Now, this is the other part. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So who is it? God does it, but he expects you to work toward it. Say, huh? Yeah. That means you can't be lazy. That means you got to come to church. That means you got to read your Bible. That means you have to pray. That's why you got to get in a small group. That's why you got to be accountable. All those things will grow you. But again, if God says... You can do all those things and not grow because God is the one who causes the growth. At some point, we have to make the things that we're talking about in the scripture more than just a good topic of discussion. Oh, let's talk about the Bible. And at some point, we've got to start living it. Let's, just not, let's not just talk about love. Let's love. Let's not just talk about prayer. Let's pray. Because again, what, what God is calling for is progress. He's calling for us 
to mature. And he's saying to some of us in this room, some of you might think you have salvation, but your, your lack of intensity in, in following out the things of God is a sign that there's something wrong. And some of us should take a, a look inside and say, okay, do I really want to mature? Or am I, just, am I just okay with coming to church and listening to good messages and getting notes? And that's good enough for me, but I really don't want to go further because if I go further, then they're going to ask more of me and more stuff is going to happen. I, I don't want to go into all that. If that's your mentality, you might be the field that doesn't produce. Again, you're hearing this. You're enlightened. You're, you feel the Holy Spirit. You're getting prayed for. All that stuff is true. But the question is, is it going to produce in you? And is God going to be the one that does that? In verse 10, he tells them, and actually in verse 9, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we're confident of better things in your case. He says, I'm talking about this crazy stuff, but I think with you guys, it's going to be better. He has hope for them. And it's possible for you to do good things and to love and to do everything that you think you should be doing in the faith and still not be mature. Look at verse 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. See, they've done stuff. They've worked. They've loved. They've continued in things. Yet he still tells them you still need to mature. And he tells them in verse 11 that diligence is the key. We want you to show that same diligence. It's a commitment to excellence. That's what the Raiders use, commitment to excellence. I think it's a wonderful um, motto that you should be committed to excellence because that is what God requires of you and he says do it with all that you can all your might all your strength with all your energy with all your zeal when we were growing up when we had to clean up we had this song that we made up in order so we can clean up fast and we call the song din din. so we say everybody we're supposed to clean up let's clean up din din, din din. and then when we did that song everybody would run and grab something and put it away really fast so we say everybody we'd be cleaning up real slow and then one of the cousins would say hey guys we need to dun dun. <laughs> Here we go. Dun dun, dun dun, dun dun. And some of us in our Christian faith, we need to dun dun. Because some of us are just like, where are you going? I'm going to serve. You need to dun dun. Get it going. And leave the elementary truths, leave these things, and go on to maturity. Again, those, those elementary things are not bad. We use those things. You need to learn how to count. You need to know what 2 plus 2 is. But it doesn't mean that you still won't need to use those same principles later. You ever ask somebody a question like, what's you know, 2 plus 2? 4. Say, what's, what's 14 plus 14? <laughs> That's so easy. <laughs> it's so simple. That's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. Why are you ask me such a simple question? 14 plus 14, that's for babies. 14 is 28. <laughs> I did all the counting in the world. I do that when I play dominoes. I'll be looking at them like, okay, how much is this? I'll be saying, hmm, and I, and I, I don't tell the truth. I'll be like, okay, I don't know what play I'm going to make because if I do that, but really I'm counting because I'm like five and four, and I use my fingers. So if you, four, five, five, six, seven. <laughs> Like, I don't know. I don't know how much this is. The numbers are confusing me. But I still use addition. I still use subtraction. But I don't stop there. At some point, I learn geometry. At some point, I learn these things. And it's okay. Learn these elementary truths, but at some point, go to maturity. This is what I'm praying for our church. That God would permit us to mature. You know it's possible? That God can say, you know, you guys are so lax. You guys are so lax. Days ago, you guys are so lazy, so dull of hearing. You guys you just sit around. I won't even permit you to mature. That scares me. I don't want to be a part of something like that. Get me out. <laughs> but like the writer says, I, I believe that God has better things for us. I don't believe God has abandoned us. I think God has shown that he's with us. But again, he's calling for us to mature. And so today, you're in this room and you're listening to this message. You're saying, you know what? In my heart, I know that my attitude towards the things of God and learning how to grow in these things, I've been, I've, I've just kind of been like, ah, eh, kind of ignoring. Earlier, the writer in Hebrews, when he's writing to them, he says, we need to be careful and consider these things 
unless we'll drift away. You ever drifted away, kind of just kind of got lax on what you're doing? Before you know it, you're doing things you weren't, you didn't think you would do, saying things you didn't think you would say. God, again, he's calling us to maturity in him. So let's pray.